Hello, welcome to The Drum. I'm Julia Baird. Coming up, backflip from Facebook as it agrees to restore Australian news to its platform. But the government agrees to changes to its media bargaining code. So who's come out ahead? $3.50 a day. Welfare advocates criticise the government's proposed increase to unemployment benefits. And faithful to the oath, Craig Kelly quits the Liberal Party, moves to the crossbench, saying he wants to speak frankly and fearlessly. And joining me on the panel this evening, we have CEO of the Property Industry Foundation, Kate Mills is back. Good to see you. Pleasure here to be on the, here. On the very bench. In Nowra, former Liberal member for Gilmore, Anne Submalis joins us again. How, how, how are things in sunny Nowra, Anne? It looks sunny, actually. Yeah, it has been spectacular just recently. <laughs> good, but okay. good to be here. Yeah, we're not jealous at all. And in Canberra, where it's always spectacular, but in a different kind of way, political reporter for The Guardian Australia, Amy, Amy Ramikas. Great to see you. And President of the National Farmers Federation, Fiona Simpson, who too has had a very busy day in our nation's capital. Appreciate you joining us. Pleasure to be here, Julia. Now, if you want to join us, you can do so on Twitter using the hashtag the drum, but not for now on Facebook. Although that may be about to change. Facebook has agreed to restore Australian news to its platform within days after reaching a deal with the federal government over its news bargaining code. Several new amendments have been inserted into the code and after discussions with his friend Mark Zuckerberg in California, the Treasurer says Facebook has now come back to the bargaining table. Absolutely critically, the code maintains its key measures. Namely, it's a mandatory code, a world-leading code. Secondly, it's based on two-way value exchange. And third, it involves a final offer arbitration mechanism. I want to thank Mark Zuckerberg for the constructive nature of the discussions that we have had. The whole purpose of the mandatory code process has been to give a strong incentive to the digital platforms to do commercial deals with Australian news media businesses. It's an example of the negotiate arbitrate model which is used uh, in a range of ways within Australian competition law and policy and these technical changes will further give a strong incentive for those commercial deals building on what we've already seen announced uh, as between Google and parties like uh, Seven West, uh, Nine Entertainment Limited, News Corp and The Guardian. Now, Facebook has its own interpretation of the deal, though. After further discussions, we are satisfied that the Australian government has agreed to a number of changes and guarantees that address our core concerns about allowing commercial deals that recognise the value our platform provides to publishers relative to the value we receive from them. As a result of these changes, we can now work to further our investment in public interest journalism and restore news on Facebook for Australians in the coming days. So, who blinked first then? For more on this, we're joined in Sydney by the Director of the Centre for Responsible Technology, Peter Lewis, who's been talking us through this very issue on the drama over the past few days. Good to see you again, Peter. Hi, hey, Julia. Hey. OK, so, yeah, we've been told uh, by the government that Facebook has re-friended Australia. But the question is, isn't it, who blinked first? What's going on here in negotiations? How do you read it? Look, I've looked through those amendments trying to see some big clawback from Facebook. They've received a notice period before the Treasurer would exercise his power to place them in the code. Um, so there's a bit of process they've got up, but it really does look like a capitulation to me. It, I feel that last Thursday's nuclear attack on Australia that didn't just hit news sites but hit civil society and government public information sites was what ended up resounding around the world. And while Facebook originally was concerned about global precedent in having a code, I think they ended up dealing with the reality that they were setting a global precedent on being a bully. So you think the global pressure played into, into them stepping back? Oh, no doubt. One of the first um, leaders Scott Morrison called was the Indian Prime Minister and Facebook's desperate to get a foothold into India. We've been seeing the wave... Um, of um, impact going on around the world. Only today, the EU and Microsoft have agreed um, to pursue a um, framework very similar to the Australian News Bargaining Code. So um, I feel that Facebook um, pushed the button, they pushed it too hard. Maybe if they'd only attacked, for instance, News Limited sites last week, then people would have not been as concerned. But the breadth of their attack really showed 
I think not just that they were prepared to do this to Australian users, but also I think has made over the last few days a lot of people reflect on the reliance we've put into this network and made us think about whether we should maybe not have all our um, eggs in the one basket. But the implications seem to be um, of the way that Paul Fletcher and Josh Frydenberg were talking about this leg legislation. Now, it wasn't as, an, as a coverall legislation, was a, we're just using this to make sure that you invest responsibly in public interest journalism in mm -hmm. Australia. Is that, is that so a always... shift there? It's that it's a stick? <clears throat> It's always been a point of leverage. So let's go back a step. The code was set up as part of a package of digital platform reform to deal with the monopoly power of big tech and its impact on the news media and public interest journalism. The code was one of a number of measures that the ACCC recommended. And yes, it's part of a way of negotiating an outcome in a market that we've never valued properly, um, which is how do you value news when there's no advertising to use as the marker? The framework is there to have a, a safety net under those negotiations that means that the monopoly players just can't walk away. So the leverage that the government has now is to say that if you don't do deals, particularly with smaller publishers that aren't have not yet done deals with Google and will need to do deals with Facebook, because remember the threshold is 150 grand a year to be able to access some of these funds, then there is always the fallback of this safety net. Just quickly, Julia, it's also important to remember there's privacy law reform, disinformation law reform, and a review of the creepy ad tech industry also as part of this package the ACCC um, recommended. And for those that are cynical that this piece of legislation appears just to be supporting big media players, it's really important to keep that momentum going as well. OK, and I want to broaden it to the rest of the panel, but just, just before I do, if you can just explain to us, I mean, these concessions... Ultimately, the Treasurer has to give advance notice a platform is going to be designated as a platform under the code. The Treasurer has to take into account any deals the platform has before designating them, any deals with, with media companies. So if the company has taken steps to pay publishers, um, it shouldn't be as hit as hard. Um, and at Facebook might not be designated under the code. So who would be designated under this code? Well platforms with monopoly power that have not come up with good faith deals to value the contribution of public interest journalism to their networks. I get that it's kind of, it feels like a weird kabuki dance because mm. the negotiations are going on in commercial inconfidence. We don't quite see what comes out the other end. But the critical thing to reflect on is a week ago, Facebook said they'd do no deal if the bargaining code became law. We're now at a point where the bargaining code is going to become law. Facebook's going to be part of that. Um, and that's going to make our, our, our democratic infrastructure stronger because we have a mechanism to value public interest journalism. What do you think this is going to mean globally, Kate? So it's interesting. I think one of the interesting things is there's no doubt that Facebook is looking at this regulation, not just in Australia, but oncoming regulation that's coming out of other countries. Mm. And it was interesting to see the response of other countries when Facebook, as Peter said, pressed the button was, we're not backing off, you know, despite the fact you've done this to Australia. So I think Facebook definitely, in terms of coming back to the bargaining table, realised that it wasn't going to get any leverage out of this with other countries are doing the same thing. The, um, the other thing that's the thing is interesting, and it'd be great to get other people's opinions on this. I mean, I think that governments and the machinery of state probably feels more robust than ever post COVID. Mm. If you look at this massive challenge that we faced, I think everyone gets that only government and state machinery can come together to, to look after those big challenges. Mm. I mean, in the end, when you get something like COVID, I mean, Facebook and Google, they can't really do anything. It's only it's really only government that can do anything. So I think governments do feel a little bit more, and I, and I know many of them are still struggling with COVID, mm. but I think they feel a little bit more robust. And I personally am proud of plucky Australia, quite frankly, <laughs> being one of the first to stand up to the tech titans and, and get what I think is a really good outcome, which I think will encourage other governments to say, yeah, you know, we've managed COVID and the state machinery can deal with other big challenges, such as, you know, monopolistic power practices, such as right. you see in technology. Right, although this had been in train for, for some time. How do you see it, Amy? 
Uh, I think Peter pretty much nailed it when he said that Facebook was looking at the rest of the world when they were deciding what to do here. I mean, I don't think Facebook particularly cares about, you know, how much the Australian audience matters to its global product. We we're relatively small in that sense, but they were worried about how the rest of the world was viewing this. So I think they, after given the reaction that happened when they just pulled all the news sites, they had to come back to the table and they had to come up with some sort of win or some little concession so they could go actually no now we fix this and we're coming back to the bargaining table and everything is hunky dory i also take up uh, kate's point about governments feeling plucky as you say yes this is something that has been in train since scott morrison was treasurer uh, so it was that long ago and it's something the a triple c has been looking at but it also speaks to the influence that certain media companies have in australia over the government because that's really what got this code over the line it was lobbying from media companies not necessarily the government's own goodness that did this. Mm. Where do you think this leaves The Guardian? Well, I mean, The Guardian has signed up with, uh, with uh, Google Showcase, so uh, we obviously are taking part in these deals. And for first smaller companies like The Guardian and some of the independent ones like Junkie, it is going to mean that you're going to have more money to invest in public journalism. What we don't have from a lot of media companies, uh, particularly the bigger ones, is that guarantee that the money that they're receiving, which is meant to be in place of advertising, will be spent on journalism. There's nothing on the code that says that they absolutely have to do that. So I think that the onus is on media companies companies to follow through with public expectations, which is to spend that money on reporting. Mm. So we need to be strong on the question of accountability. Fiona, can I ask you, like, a, a lot of people were quite... Take, some people may have not even noticed any change to their Facebook pages necessarily. People who, some people who ran small businesses or small councils or not-for-profits like domestic violence shelters were kind of shocked to see that this information, this data that they'd built up for years was suddenly taken. Um, and we'll be waiting for it to be restored. Do you think that's going to change any of the thinking around where, what these groups and operators, how, what their digital presence is going to be and if they should continue to be on Facebook? Yeah, look, absolutely. I think it was a huge shock seeing some of our... The sites that we absolutely rely on, so the BOM, the Bureau of Meteorology, went down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Food Bank went down. Uh, a lot of our, our social support networks went down. And so I think it was a huge shock to everybody just how reliant we actually are on Facebook. And, you know, they say the art of success negotiation is everybody having a win-win or feeling like they've had a win. So if we actually won um, and Facebook felt like they had a win, well, that's good. But look, I love to see Australia leading the world. Um, and I also think it's been an interesting week because they did push the nuclear button in a week where in Australia we're really focusing on corporate culture. So Crown Casino hmm. right here in Parliament House and, and Facebook, when they push that nuclear button and, and really dismantled so much of our social fabric. Um, I think at the end of the day, if, if government has come out you know stronger and and we've had a bit of a win in that space then I think it will make us in regional Australia really think about our reliance on some of those um, those engines and um, and also maybe you know look to more traditional outlets I know ABC News I think's had a huge sign up mm, um, um, online with about people that. yeah people <laughs> following directly now instead of through their Facebook feeds yep. um, and I think that's probably ultimately a good thing mm. Peter, before we lose you, can I just ask you to equip those of our viewers who are like, hang on a minute, I don't have a moment, I don't have time to read through the detail of this. It's done what with what code, wait, what decision, what neg what do they need to be looking for over this next period as we wait to see how the negotiations pan out? What are the crucial factors to ensure that that that, that journalism is protected here? I think the first test is whether the smaller publishers um, are able to get deals with the, the companies that actually underwrite their ongoing viability as well. The game changer here is there's now a third income stream alongside subscription and advertising to sustain public interest journalism. But broader, and I think this is a challenge on all of us, let's see if our media companies and our politicians follow through with the rest of the reform pro process, particularly citizen data privacy, with the same enthusiasm as the media companies have um, pursued the reforms to put more money in their pockets. All right. Really appreciate having your time again this evening. Thank you, Peter Lewis. Peter is the Director of the Centre for Responsible Technology. Now, when COVID hit and thousands suddenly found themselves out of work, unemployment benefits were overhauled. 
What was once known as New Start was doubled from $550 a fortnight to $1,100. Overnight, those that had been on the old rate saw their lives and their livelihoods transformed. This is what one person told us that money did for them. The first thing I bought was a new pair of glasses. I've caught up on my electricity bill. Um, I've bought some new shoes uh, and clothes and I've caught up on my rent. You know, you, you couldn't afford to buy a lot of the things that you needed. Um, but now I can go in and look at the fifties knowing that I've got the money to buy them. So that anxiety isn't there. Since then, the payment has gradually decreased as the government's stimulus measures taper off. Opposition parties and welfare groups, though, have been campaigning for the rate to increase. And today the government said that it will, by $50 a fortnight. It is true that this is one of the single... that it is the single largest increase in the job seeker payments since the mid-80s, year on year. That is true. But I think the more relevant feature to focus on is what it is as a percentage of the national minimum wage. And this brings it up from 37.5% up to... Uh, up, up to 41.2 per cent. Social security payments, welfare support, when people need it is something we strongly believe in. Despite this though, the opposition and welfare advocates have been united in condemning the government's increase as far too little. The government has missed its opportunity to be a government that stood for human decency, to be a government that stood for human dignity, that be a, to be a government that stood and genuinely had people's backs. This government has announced an increase of $3.50 per day. This $3.50 per day is a measly, mean-spirited and complete betrayal of what is needed. And said Marlis, measly, mean-spirited and complete betrayal from ACOS there. Is that fair? Uh, <laughs> I've... ACOS generally criticises whatever the Conservative government does. And I need to say, firstly, yes, $50 is probably going to be a hard stretch for a lot of people, mm. but it certainly is going to be a shot in the arm for a lot of people who haven't had a lot of money to play with. Um, I was speaking earlier that perhaps we need to review it in six months' time and have different levels, as I think there always should have been. Like, there are females who are in their late 50s who find it extraordinarily difficult to get a job and they need a lot more assistance than a young job seeker because they're very often living at home or in a group house. So I think one of the other things we should really be looking at, and I know this is particularly relevant on the South Coast, is some sort of additional supplement for living in a rented accommodation or some other way of housing people who've got very little to spend. Um, particularly here after the fires and the subsequent floods, our rental stock is all but disappeared. Mm. And that's made it incredibly difficult for people who are on a very limited income to find somewhere to live. Mm. So I think there needs to be a double pronged attack to this. Review it in six months time and see which people are being desperately disadvantaged and see if there's wriggle room there to move and increase it somewhat. And the other is to look at the housing stock and how to remedy that situation problem is that becomes a state said federal said disagreement all the time and there really needs to be a bit of settled debate and compromise a bit like they've managed to do with Facebook. Mm. Although the government's saying this is their compromise I mean there's no question of a review that's been aired in no, six months I'm or put, any time. I'm putting my, I'm putting that's my right, that's your call. Yeah. I can. <laughs> But Amy, at the same time, the Prime Minister is saying this is the largest increase in job seeker payment since the mid 1980s. Yeah, it is. And the coalition has been in power for the majority of that time. And we're only talking $3.50 to $4 a day. So that apparently is something that we need to celebrate. I mean, I take Anne's point, but we know, we know how people are surviving on the payment as it is, and they're not. They're not surviving. We just heard from someone who was talking about buying glasses, being able to catch up on their rent, pay their electricity bill. We know the damage that the low unemployment benefit causes to our society. And they were the first people we turned to to keep the economy going when the COVID emergency happened. That's why we doubled the payment, because those people have to spend the money. 
they don't have the luxury of saving anything and that we keep consigning millions of people to live below the poverty line because it plays well politically is absolutely ridiculous. And just one last point, when we're talking about, oh, we're linking it to a minimum wage, 41 whatever percent it was, that was something that John Howard did when he changed how we index the payment. So we've been making mistakes with this on and on and on and we keep giving tax cuts because apparently the working public need more money in their pockets to survive in this economy but the people who don't work don't. Right, and when John Howard changed that indexing, it was from being indexed to the wages, wage growth to the CPI, right? And we've been through a very stagnant period when it comes to wage growth. Uh, Fiona, what do you make of this new phone line that um, Michaelia Cash spoke about today that's been established for employers to be able to call the government if they offer someone a job um, and they, t they turn it down? Actually, that's the first I've heard of it. I've been, oh, right. <laughs> been in and out of all sorts of different things today and that one hasn't come across my desk. Yes. Um, I tend to think, though, that, you know, so what's it actually going to serve? Is it how much is it going to cost to set up? What's it actually going to serve? And I think mm. when it comes to, to Job Seeker, um, I actually think it's, it's a really difficult thing. So it's meant to be... Uh, more or less temporary payment, hopefully, uh, where people are going to be paid enough money to live so that they can actually look for work. So they need to be able to, to spend money on rent, they need to be able to spend money on food, they need to be able to spend money on electricity. Um, and then I know a lot of my, my members feel that there's a lot of jobs in the region. Last year the jobs figures have just come out. Um, the job advertisements went up nearly 40% in the regions. So, you know, there's this sort of feeling that if we pay people too much, then they're not going to, to want to look for jobs, but I tend to think we need to be much more inventive with it. Um, how do we know whether $50, you know, it's not, a, you know, the Business Council actually says they think it should be somewhere around 75 to 80 percent of the pension. It's nowhere near that yet. Mm. So for me, um, it's really difficult to know whether $50 is the right amount. Doesn't seem like a lot when I compare it to local rents. I know the regional communities that do depend on people spending some of this money in their small businesses um, are going to feel the pain, and people themselves who are, are, are trying to live on this and also look for work. So uh, I think we need to get a little bit more inventive. We certainly need to. To look at helping people get out of that, that not ever getting into the, the jobless spiral, so education, training, skills development, those sorts of things. Mm. And um, I think, you know, we need to really then be, Rebecca Sharkey, who I, I, I ran into earlier, um, she suggested an independent commission. I don't know, it's another commission, another body, mm. but how do we know, you know, John Howard said we should link it to the minimum wage, um, you know, the Business Council says we should link it to the pension. At the end of the day, we want people to be resourced, but also to be able to look for work and to develop skills and training and maybe volunteering. So how can we pay them enough for that? And um, so to me, it's a it's a real it's a real problem. Mm. Right. So just before we move on, Amy, I just want to go back to you quickly on the question of um, this new phone line. I mean, aren't there a lot of reasons that that someone might not want to take a job? You might go through the whole process, all of the interview, and decide that the culture of the company isn't quite quite right for you. In fact, the hours don't really work with your, your kids after all, or the commute could be wrong. Does it give... Are there concerns around that kind of... with a wiggle room over that? There's heaps of concerns and I've been contacted by people all day talking about jobs that they've turned down because they didn't feel comfortable in that particular workplace. They didn't like the questions that were being asked because, you know, one person pointed out that uh, she applied for a job with a lawyer and then found out that she would be working alone with him in his house. There are millions of reasons why people turn down jobs and it's not because they don't want to work. It's because they it doesn't work for them and that is not unreasonable, I don't think. And the fact that we have a, like a NARC line being set up to allow employ employers to say this person didn't take a job, therefore their benefits should be cut, I think is absolutely re repre reprehensible. And one last thing, we actually build unemployment into our economy. It's part of the economic levers that we pull to keep inflation down and control inflation and to control workers and their demands and things. And before COVID, we still had an unemployment rate that was around 5-6%. So that's still about 600,000 people or so who were without work before the pandemic happened and we are still leaving them to live in poverty and it is not good enough. Mm.
All right. Well, Scott Morrison is a very busy man at the moment, along with the vaccine rollout and the rise in the job seeker rate. There's now the pesky issue of Craig Kelly resigning from the Liberal Party. And don't worry, we are getting to that. But through all of this, there's the questions that won't go away. Questions about the culture in Canberra. Questions over who knew, knew what and when. Questions, of course, that concern Brittany Higgins, the former Liberal staffer who was allegedly raped in Defence Minister Linda Reynolds' office two years ago. The Prime Minister insists these are questions he's committed to answering. They're important issues and we are addressing them and, and the process that we're engaged in in a multi-party way, which uh, the Minister, is, uh, Minister Birmingham is leading that process now and I look forward to that uh, process being settled very, very soon. Uh, I don't want to preempt the recommendations of that uh, inquiry, but I've already moved this week to ensure there is additional counselling support that's available to staff right now. There are now four separate inquiries that have been announced covering a range of issues from how to improve the workplace culture at Parliament House to who knew what inside the Prime Minister's office about Ms Higgins' alleged rape. Can I just ask a broad question of you, first of all, Kate? When you look at this, do you see a systemic issue? Oh, I, yeah, I do see a systemic issue. And, and not just in Parliament, just in workplaces and work culture generally. I mean, that, that awful incident that um, Brittany Higgins is talking about, I mean, that happens across all different types of workplaces, large and small. Um, the issue is, I think, is how do you recognise it's a systemic issue? And, you know, in the end, most people tend to individualise it. So, you know, when somebody comes to you and says there's been an incident, you tend to think about just that person and just about that incident. You probably, as an employer, are only going to come across a couple of those incidents, you know, if you're really unfortunate over your whole career. You're rarely going to see the full picture to see the number of incidents that happen across the Australian workforce in every year. You know, with regards to Parliament, I know they've got the four inquiries going on, um, and, and, you know, time, how, how you shift culture. In one way, it's about how do you make sure that people see the entire system and they see all the incidents that are happening so that they can grapple with the problem? You know, can you bring in a system where you say that any incident that happens is reported, even if it, even if it isn't, you know, doesn't go up another level to police, for example, it is mm. reported so that somebody somewhere sees the level and the number of incidences that are happening within Parliament as a workplace, but also probably in workplaces more generally across mm. Australia. Although we already had Kate Jenkins' report into workplace harassment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It showed how broad it is. is. So yeah. how many more reports? But, but for each workplace, so that's a report, yeah. But yep. let's say you're working in a workplace, yeah. Yep. So you're working in Parliament. Is there any one person there that manages to see it as mm. a systemic issue within their workplace? Mm. I, I, I think doing reports is great. It's mm. sometimes difficult to translate them into your work practices, right. if that makes sense. You know, yep. the report lands on your desk and you read it, but you can't connect it to your work and your workplace and what to do about it. Yep. And, and this, is a, this is a workplace that you have worked in. Um, <laughs> do we need four inquiries into this? My, uh, look, my opinion on that is Brittany has opened a door on a whole stack of issues that have been bubbling below the surface for quite some time. I, I need to make a point that I think she is amazing to have come forward in the way that she has knowing that the consequences were going to go down the track that they have. Mm -hmm. um, I think there needs to be some... Uh, your last speaker just sort of intimated, there needs to be a neutral ground where you can go and report an incident that is not seen to be vexatious or politically damaging to either to yourself or to anybody else, but so that that person can advise you that this isn't the first time this person has done this and we think it's in your best interest and that of everybody else that you take it further and do you need assistance to do that? So that they're nurtured and taken care of emotionally and professionally and given an opportunity to actually act on things like this because the house, just like the last speaker said, it, it is a workplace. It had The only slight difference is there is so much underground commentary that happens either through the media or through the party or through other things that can be not always a positive influence. Um, can I ask you one other question as well is um, the, the fact that it keeps getting framed as a partisan issue um, now, ABC reporter Louise Milligan tweeted earlier that the Prime Minister quoted her in Parliament today to prove that Labor also has issues about toxic behaviour. She said that's true, but of dozens of dozens of calls we made to staff and politicians from all sides, 
the vast majority of allegations volunteered, not sought, were about Liberals and Nationals. How do you read that? I don't know how to read that because when I was there, I heard rumours that it was rife in different areas, that harassment was happening, possibly not quite as significant as this, in every party. And women were finding it difficult to keep their feet on the ground and to stay strong because there was always this incredible power dynamic. So while some people right now might be saying it's all, all Liberal Party, I, I find that difficult. And I, I, I know that Linda and Michaelia are very strong female advocates, both in their field of expertise before they came to Parliament, but certainly within the Parliament, and to, in some ways, some people are blaming them now for not stepping up and, in other people's eyes, doing the right thing. Nobody knows of all the other considerations that happen when you're in the House. And I think Scott's actually chosen the very best person who, in my opinion, has an exceptionally high level of integrity to get to the nitty-gritty of this issue and hopefully there is actually a cultural shift and I think it's high time and I think Simon can do it. But when you um, left Parliament, you cited it, you know, bullying that had occurred against you and there were other women around the same time who also spoke very publicly about it. Um, yeah. Julia Banks, Kelly Dwyer, you know, Dwyer kind of backed her since Julie Bishop has subsequently made comments about the behaviour towards w women in the parliament. I mean, do, do you, within the party, do you think that there, that there is a real problem there? Um, look, I, I'm coming from a very biased perspective. I am of the opinion that once a woman makes a good impression in politics, then some other little whippersnapper will say, oh, she's made a big difference, that seat's a bit safer now, I think I'll have a crack at it. And so there isn't the respect there for all the work that you put in. And I know that that happened to Julie Bishop. Um, I know that it's happened to Julia Banks. There was a whole stack of different considerations there. There is, but I didn't get bullied so much at my federal level. And I certainly didn't have the terrible experiences that poor Brittany has had. And I consider myself to be lucky. Um, and I just hope that she has a very good circle of friend and support because it must be so tough. Yeah. Look, I'm not sure that it's just party related. I do know that there is a support system um, on the other side of politics that I'm not aware of on the side of politics of which I was a member. Maybe that is something that the Libs need to investigate in a, a more holistic way mm. in, to enable more women to actually get into parliament. And bottom line is women give an entirely different perspective mm. than men um, very often. And that balance is you land up with people like Fiona who, who give you an incredibly balanced um, and I've, I've listened to her on a number of occasions and a number of um, presentations in the House. They're balanced and they're perceptive and they're not ambitious. It's, it's like they're putting the needs of other people before their own ad agenda. And I think women are very good at that. Can we be ambitious too? Oh, yeah, nothing wrong with that. But it usually comes second to other people. Um, Fiona, look... Um... Can I bring it back to the question of the professional context? Because I know that this, you had a, a similar incident, um, instance that was not to do with, um, you know, not, not to do with rape and not, wasn't at the NFF, but, but someone came and spoke to you and said that an employee um, had been, had, had an assault at another workplace. So what, what did that show you about what kind of processes we need in place to be able to deal with that at work? Well, I think I, I really contrasted that experience with what's happening now here in Parliament. And so for me, um, it was absolutely a priority of mine in that organisation and, and, and the board that, that we were in to be setting up the, the right culture within that organisation. And it was a culture where the employees felt, felt valued, they valued each other, um, where they felt um, there, were, there, there were clear and transparent processes in place and they felt supported um, in whatever they needed to bring forward. And so um, when that 
um, attack happened. Then I was informed by the CEO that that had happened and I was informed about the processes that were taking place, which included um, putting in place a supporter for that person as they went through the process that she determined she wanted to follow. Now, um, she was also a little bit embarrassed. She didn't want the whole board to know about it and um, she didn't particularly want me to talk to her about it. So for me, I think culture is one of those um, really complex issues. Uh, it absolutely should transcend politics. I have to say Parliament House is one of the mm, most, uh, I, for me it doesn't live up to the expectations that the commercial um, boards that I sit on do um, why do you, in why 2021. Why do you think that is? Why? Um, I think it's a, it's a really interesting mix. So we've got a lot of really committed, passionate people in here who, as Anne said, a lot of them have had to fight very hard to get where, they, where they've got. Um, there's a lot of power. They don't call it the corridors of power for nothing. Um, there's a lot of you know, egos. And in some areas, there's a lot of males. Um, and we know that diversity makes a huge difference, um, whether we're talking about genders, whether we're talking about background, skills, expertise, etc. And I think we also have some, some people who are not taking responsibility, A, for their own behaviour, but also maybe a little bit of lack of respect for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so the, the culture thing, I think, absolutely transcends politics. It has to be a whole of Parliament House thing. Obviously, each party is going to take responsibility for their own, and they should take responsibility for the culture within their own party and how they choose their representatives. But when it comes to a workplace, um, it does, for me, come down to... It, you, you can set the culture at the top, um, but I actually think everybody has to then take that on board as well and be personally responsible. And it does come down to respect. Culture doesn't happen in a day. Mm. It doesn't happen in a week. Um, it does have to be something that everybody really wants and strives for. And mm. that's, um, that's why it's difficult here. Right, right. It takes leadership it as well. Um, Amy, I wanted to ask you about a comment made by your boss, uh, Lenore Taylor, that was posted on Instagram where she said, we had lists that we gave to new women who came to the press gallery about politicians who you really shouldn't go and visit, it, visit in their offices alone. I mean, this is kind of like it was such an open and known thing, especially amongst women who tried to protect other women by 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 giving them these, these lists. How could it continue then for so long? Yeah, well, I mean, Lenore was talking about when she first arrived in the press gallery, which was 25 years ago, and Karen Middleton, another great senior uh, female journalist, has also written previously on, on that exact same issue. It carried on for so long because, like, as, as Fiona just said, the parliament culture is, is behind. It is behind the corporate world. What happens here, it wouldn't happen in any other workplace. Mm. And part of that is, as pointed out, is the ego and and just, you know, the nature of, of how parliament works and how ministers uh, have their own little fiefdoms and then the staffers look after the ministers. And part of it is because women aren't equal here. I mean, Labor obviously has problems. Every political party does because every aspect of society does. But Labor has worked to like get equality within its female representation. We've done that through quotas in the Labor Party. Well, not we, I've said they've done that through quotas in the Labor Party. And we've seen that play out in the representation in the both houses, in the Senate and in the chamber of the House of Representatives. We haven't seen the same thing happen in the Liberal Party. We keep getting told that it's on merit, but women seem to be missing out when it comes to on that merit. And they do offer a great perspective and they do offer a difference of opinion what we have seen play out over this last week has been politics. We've seen a political response to a very human problem. We have seen women have to come forward and essentially perform their rage and their grief publicly and put their name to it to have an issue be taken seriously when we know it exists. We know it exists because women have come forward previously and said this has been an issue and it has been a distraction or it's been something that they're not going to get involved with or it's going to be something that we're going to deal with and 
move on. We have had cultural reviews. We have had investigations. We have had women come forward and say, I have lost my career because of this and we need to show light on it. It has taken an allegation of rape in the parliament to get to this point where we still don't have an independent investigation. We have politicians looking at politicians. It's not good enough. If you want change, you need to start it from the top. And that means actually getting rid of politics and treating this as you would outside of this building, which is bringing in somebody to have a look at it across the board, not just your political party, not just your part of the world, not just your chamber, across the actual board. And we don't have that yet. Mm. All right, if you need support, call Lifeline on 13 11 14 or 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732. The government is now one seat short of an outright majority in Parliament. But before you get ahead of yourself and start thinking about elections or the like, let me just put this into context. Craig Kelly has joined the crossbench, but by his own admission, he'll continue to vote with the government on most matters. And the Prime Minister himself doesn't seem too worried about an imminent challenge. If the Leader of the Opposition is feeling so confident, Mr Speaker, about the performance of his opposition, Mr Speaker, well then perhaps you'd like to bring on a motion. Yes, Craig Kelly may have resigned the Liberal Party, but it's unlikely he'll be out of the headlines for long. He has spent much of this year facing a crossfire of criticism for his social media posts. In case you haven't been paying attention, here's just a bit of it. Do you see parallels with this COVID-19 pandemic alarmism? All the modelling that we saw, uh, apocalyptic number of deaths, uh, our hospitals unable to cope, this was all done to scare people. Craig Kelly is a problem, and it's a problem for the government, and it's a problem for the country. Craig Kelly is the most prolific Facebook poster in Parliament. Craig Kelly is a dangerous menace and a threat to the nation's COVID response. You're spending $24 million of taxpayer funds on a uh, vaccine campaign. At the same time, you don't rein in your own government MPs who are spreading disinformation about both the virus and the vaccines. Don't go to Facebook to find out about the vaccine. Go to official government websites. You don't go to Craig Kelly? I, I, he's not my doctor and he's not yours. Craig Kelly's been making uh, some media appearances and he clashed with Tanya Plibersek today. So, so says, your Prime Minister is wrong, says, is he? Our Prime Minister is 100% right. He agrees with I'm you. I'm saying you Scott are Morrison, wrong. Scott listen, Morrison agrees listen, with you, does he, Craig? Listen. Views expressed by the member for Hughes uh, do not align with my views or the views of the advice that has been provided to me by the Chief Medical Officer. Now, the Prime Minister says that it's disagreement over this kind of behaviour that precipitated Mr Kelly's resignation. I set out very clear expectations on a range of matters um, that I expected uh, Craig to follow through on. He'd given me a number of commitments in relation to that. He no longer felt that he could meet those commitments. And as a result, he's made his decision today. He has said that his actions uh, were slowing the government down. And he believed the best way for him to proceed was to, to remove himself from the party room and, and provide the otherwise support to the government. Craig Kelly doesn't seem to disagree with this, saying he couldn't speak freely while still serving the Liberal Party. Over the past several months, I've been subject to a slander and smear campaign when my goal was only to save lives by ensuring that my constituents Members on my and, in left. fact, all Australians were not being denied access to medical treatments. Therefore, I see if I'm content to continue to act in line with my conscience and my principles and the oath that I took on becoming a member of this parliament and continue to speak fearlessly and faithfully, representing my constituents. I have no alternate other than to take the action that I have. Amy, in his resignation letter, Craig Kelly said he was acting with his conscience and principle, not political expediency. There have been a lot of questions about whether other factors have come into play, whether his staffer, about which there have been um, allegations from teenage interns about very inappropriate behaviour, uh, there's been discussion about, fr you know, free speech, obviously, as they mentioned, but also is a pre-selection and whether he'd have sufficient numbers. What is actually going on? Is it as it seems? 
Uh, if you mean does it, as it seems to be a mess, then yeah, <laughs> it is an absolute mess. I mean, Craig Kelly has had his pre-selection saved in the past by Tony Abbott. He's had it saved by Malcolm Turnbull. He's had it saved by Scott Morrison. So this isn't a new issue for the government. Craig Kelly has, has caused waves wherever he's gone. But as you point out, the timing of this is very suspect in that uh, we saw it was Anne Davies from The Guardian who published on Friday allegations which had been made against Craig Kelly's staffer. Uh, Eliza Barr, a News Corp journalist who covers court, had previously covered some of those issues last year. We don't know what the Prime Minister knew and when because some of his comments around that have been quite confused as well. At first he said that he had spoken to Mr Kelly about these issues uh, regarding the staffer and the allegations and he expected action and that action wasn't taken and that Mr Kelly made his own decision. Later he said that he was talking about performance measures and he hadn't spoken, uh, he hadn't heard until very recently about some of these issues but we know as Eliza Barr from News Corp pointed out she had gone to the PMO last year uh, with these allegations from her court covering. So there, it is very suspect but what does it mean? Well as you say Craig Kelly is still going to vote with the government, he just doesn't have any restraints on what he says anymore. He can get up and put whatever he wants on Facebook, he can stand up and talk about whatever he wants and he can say whatever he wants in news interviews and I'm sure he'll be getting plenty because backbenchers who leave the government usually do uh, without any restraints or any weights on him to maybe start to think about what it is that he's saying. And St Marlis, does this uh, surprise you at all? No, uh, Craig's been a maverick for years and he always used the, the threat over contentious issues that he would uh, cross the floor or leave the party or whatever. Including the um, Banking Royal Commission? Banking Royal Commission was one of them and uh, there was better ways to solve that problem by actually getting some background information, talking directly to the Prime Minister and the Treasurer at the time, which is what I did because that was a big issue for me. Another one, of course, was, um, and Fiona would be familiar with this, when we almost had the, the a really good compromise energy program in place. The National Farmers Federation loved it, the Chamber of National Chamber of Commerce loved it. Everybody loved it except about four backbenchers, one of whom was Craig, and they blew it to smithereens and I was not impressed at the time. Um, look, you can speak frankly in the party room except that somebody will leak. If you're not afraid that somebody will leak, then you speak frankly. If you're trying to support your government, then you go and talk to the relevant minister and say, this is my firmly held opinion, I wish to speak on it. And they will say, well, this is the evidence that we have, we'd prefer you didn't. You can still speak on it if that's what you want. So I don't know why he's saying, you know, he can go and speak frankly. I don't think he's truly representing his electorate anymore. Mm. I think he's um, representing those people who have weird, in my view, weird beliefs and lack evidence to support their belief system and I think those are the ones he's pandering to. I want to put that to you, Kate, actually, because this is a question there. This is something that he has said repeatedly. If I'm going to represent my constituents primarily but also all of the Australian people, I need to be able to air these, what he calls alternative views, what others might call misinformation about medical treatments for the COVID vaccine. Who is he serving by doing that? Mainly himself, I suspect, actually. Um, <laughs> exactly. Look, look, he speaks to an audience of which I'm not part, yeah. So, I'm, you know, the, the information that he puts out there doesn't resonate with me. But we do know that it resonates with some people um, in Australia and globally. So there is absolutely an audience for it. I mean, I, I probably... I'm here with Anne here, which is... I mean, I don't know his electorate. I'm not from his electorate. But the feedback I've seen from his electorate gets stronger and stronger that he doesn't represent them. So he's obviously talking to a different electorate. I'm not sure who. Um, and, and I guess, you know, in the end, those two will pull apart, you know, in terms of when it comes around to the election again, it's his electorate, you know, his actual physical electorate that has the choice versus the audience that he's talking to, which are out there but don't form an actual electorate. So we'll, we'll see how that, how that works out for mm. him. That is the ultimate question, isn't it, Fiona, how it plays out in the electorate? It's, that's the ultimate question. So we know that he's been saved in the pre-selection battle several times now. Um, and, you know, I always think it's very brave of politicians to be elected in wearing a certain hat and then midstream mm. you change that hat. And ultimately, you know, he says he's speaking out for his constituents, but they'll vote at the ballot box. Um, mm. And that's, that's really the end of the day. Mm. Mm. 
All right, well, COVID has shown that many of us can work from basically anywhere. And if you live in an urban area and no longer need to go into the office, you might be looking to move out of the city. And you wouldn't be alone. In the last year, the median price of Sydney homes rose by 4.5%. But outside of the city, prices were up by almost double that amount. Towns like Parks and Kiama saw prices rise by 24% and 20% respectively. But it was Byron Bay that saw the biggest rise, with the median cost of a home rising by 26% to $1.15 million. So the question is then, how do we strengthen regional areas and improve the livelihoods of those already living there without pricing them out of, a, of their own backyards? And Fiona, this is the question exactly that you've been grappling with today. Can you tell us what happened in Canberra at the National Press Club? Yeah, look, we launched uh, in, co in coordination with the Business Council, Council of Small Business, um, Regional Development Australia, a regionalisation agenda. And we really strongly believe that we have a, a one in 100 year opportunity at the moment. Uh, after COVID, we all saw not just people speaking with their feet. So I think in the September quarter of last year, 11,200 um, people moved from urban areas to regional areas. That was when Victoria was under lockdown. So mm -hmm. that's the biggest single um, move that we've ever seen. We've seen the house prices go up. We've seen strong jobs growth. I said earlier, nearly 40% extra jobs. Um, actually advertised in the regions now. And we've also had this feeling during COVID that we don't want to be dependent on other countries for everything. We do want to look again at our manufacturing capabilities, our, our food processing capabilities. Uh, as agriculture, we have $100 billion worth of value by 2030. And we think that the regions now are absolutely, um, again, right poised if we can make the most of this opportunity to drive Australia and be the, the engine rooms again of Australia's economy into the next century. But we need to do that. There's a few simple things that we've asked for today. One is, um, so it is already a, a, a um, national um, cabinet agenda item for 2021. Um, Minister Andrew G is doing a great job in his portfolio. But we need some metrics um, around mm. it. So we know that people are moving to the regions, but it needs to be livable. We need to have metrics around the con connectivity, around the infrastructure, around education, around housing, around health, so that people stay in the regions. Mm. We know there's lots of jobs but we need them to stay. Secondly, the way that Infrastructure Australia targets big ticket items of infrastructure spending, um, the, the, the uh, sum that they do is all based upfront. So they give a lot of weight to the benefits in year one, year two, year three, but not so much weight to the benefits in year 10, 20 and 30. And so when we're talking about some of this investment that's actually going to, to really connect the regions, build regions, build regional communities, then we need to look further out and we need Infrastructure Australia to be doing that. So right now we think um, an amazing opportunity both for the city and the bush mm. and this is a win-win for everybody if we can get it right but we need the three tiers of government working together strategically. Um, we do need to, government to make it priority and we need to, we say, let's let's pick some winners. Let's pick 20 communities around Australia and New South Wales already. There's four communities that are having strategic activation precincts, parks, Wagga Wagga, the the Snowies and Moree. Um, it's not hard to come up with 20. Um, let's, let's actually plan that whole region. So it's not just about the town, it's about the smaller satellite towns as well and the region. Let's plan what infrastructure they need. Let's, let's plan their energy needs, as Helen Haynes has said. Um, let's look at the manufacturing hubs as, as the gov federal government are doing in technology and let's really get these regions firing. Uh, and how do you view this? Because you live in, um, obviously, in Nowra on the New South Wales south coast. It's a um, wildly popular area. House prices have been going up there. I expect there's been quite a significant influx. Is it always a good thing? I mean, if we don't have this investment alongside, won't there be kind of a lot of grumbling from locals about the housing market, about the inflation of, of prices? I, I think there's been two migrational aspects to the South Coast. One is post-COVID and during COVID, they suddenly discovered the South Coast. Hmm. And so there's a number of villages, including mine where I live, which is Colborough Beach. We have had a drop in permanent residents because a number of the houses have been bought as Airbnb facilities. Hmm. Um, that's also caused a lot of changes to the rental market. I know that there are one, two, three, about half a dozen 
housing estates where there's upwards of 250 to 300 houses which will be affordable and they've got good amenity. The biggest, biggest problem for any regional town is transport right. and that is to enable people to get to medical appointments, to get their children to school, to just be connected to a greater area rather than just living quietly in their little village. And as village communities age, that becomes a bigger and bigger problem. And I, I do believe, as was said, um, three levels of government need to get together and really work out a plan here because as normally happens, there's this blame game of you should be doing this, you should be doing that, and you should be doing that, and different people saying, well, fund this, fund that. The three of them knock their heads together, sit down and plan for a 10, 20, and 30-year development program because otherwise Australia is just going to land up in another deep hole. How do we fire up our imaginations on, on, on this one, Kate, to, like, to really create powerhouses in the regions that can sustain popula populations, industries? Yeah, well, look, I, I mean, I certainly don't disagree with, with what either Fiona and Anne have said, and it's interesting because one's a sort of positive, Fiona's full of all that positive energy, and Anne's a little bit more, you know, there's all these potential negative things that can right. happen. Look, I think... Um, Figuring out that investment and being more strategic, as Fiona mentioned, is absolutely key because, you know, one way of looking at it in this kind of COVID experience is what you've got is a lot of your knowledge workers have effectively left your large cities and they've gone to the regions, but they're not working in those regions. They're actually working where they're creating economic value is actually for their organisation, which is essentially based in Sydney mm -hmm. and in Melbourne, right. and they're living, you know, out there. Right. Now, that helps in terms of the consumer power and services, mm -hmm. and you certainly see that when you go to small towns in Australia now. What you see is a lot of cafes, and I'm not anti that. Mm -hmm. It's great to have lots of cafes. But there's also demands for things like school, education. Demand for things like school, yeah. but it's all services, yes, mm -hmm. and that's great so you have a services economy which we are but how do you make a more robust economy which is what Fiona's talking about how do you bring in that technology how do you bring in um, manufacturing how do you bring in all that issue around what what does Australia look like in a world where you want to have more sure um, uh, supply chains how can you do that that definitely requires government because in the end and you know I love individuals but individuals go up and they love to buy their coffee and they love to walk on the beach um, and they love the fact that they're getting paid a you know a little bit of slightly less than a Sydney or a Melbourne wage and they're living somewhere and they can mm. afford that property mm. but like Anne said the problem is it hollows out some of those communities for locals because they can no longer afford to live mm. there and in terms of the kind of deep industries that really fire up a country you need government leadership it will not happen on its own mm. Mm. Have you, and what about the kind of like the thinking of generations who aren't able, um, Amy, to buy property in their, in their, uh, you know, in the bigger cities? Are you hearing a lot of people moving to regions? Is this going to start a different way in terms of the way we think about settling or growing older in Australia? Well, potentially, but I don't think it's any of the regions that we've been talking about. I mean, I could never afford a South Coast property in right. my wildest dreams. Right. I think oh, it depends we're talking, where you, go. you know, <laughs> even those... <laughs> I think we're talking, you don't know how much I get paid. <laughs> um, you, t you, go, you have to go back further and further and further. And then that brings again all of the problems that we've just heard discussed. I mean, we have an issue where we're telling people you can work in one area, but you can't necessarily afford to live there. So maybe you should live somewhere else. But we don't have the transport for you to do that. We don't necessarily have the industry for you to set up a life here. And we want to keep talking about this and we want these things to happen, but we don't actually have a plan to make them happen. You do need government, but you also need all three tiers of government. And at the moment, we don't even have local councils in national cabinet. We removed them as when we changed it from the COAG process. Yeah. So this is something that actually re requires a lot of long-term thinking and rather just we're going to do this review or we're going to move this public service area over here and we're going to do this. Right. We actually just need to sit down and map it out. Which is exactly, I think, what Fiona was doing today. <laughs> so we're going to end on that point. I want to thank our panel for the discussion. Have to show you that. There it is. <laughs> Kate Mills, Ansid Marlis, Amy, Amy Ramikas and Fiona Simpson. Thanks to everyone. Hope you have a great evening. You're going to have, no, me with you tomorrow. See you. Good night.